So I want you to imagine for a second that what happened at the end of World War II was a little bit different, and that, that Hitler, who was responsible for, you might say, the organization that led to six million Jews dying, a, a horrendous evil, wouldn't you say? I mean, one of the, the worst atrocities in history. If you've seen pictures before, you've seen what happened in concentration camps, you think, this guy, if anybody, deserves justice, does he not? So I want you to imagine that his life didn't end with suicide like it did, but instead he comes to the court and we try him for his war crimes. And as we're there in court and we're trying him for war crimes, the, the place is packed and maybe, maybe you were there and, and you come in and you're, you're watching and you're, you're listening to the, 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 the verdict that's going to be given. And he's the, clearly guilty. There's, there's a preponderance of evidence. There's, there's no doubt that he's guilty. And so as the judge comes in to render the sentence, he slams the gavel and the moment is coming. You're so excited because finally Hitler's going to get his. And the judge says, I sentence Hitler to life in torture. And you're like, wait a second. I think I misheard. Maybe I need to adjust my hearing aid for a second. And he said, Here's the deal. He's going to be sent to Guantanamo Bay, and we're going to, for, for the rest of his life, we're going to make sure he gets the best possible medical care so that Hitler can leave, live as long as possible. We want to make sure that he lives as long as possible so that we can participate in waterboarding. We can take his fingernails off. We can put him on the rack and stretch him, and, and we're going to, day in and day out, we want to hear Hitler scream for year after year after year, day after day after day. Now, I don't know about you, but I want Hitler to have justice, but is that, would that be a little unsettling to you today if I could tell you, actually, Hitler's in Guantanamo Bay, and this is what's happening to him right now? At what point do we say, okay, okay, stop. Stop the madness. He, he, he made a horrible mistake and hurt tons and tons of people, but this is, this is not okay. At what point do we say, stop? And you see, throughout history, there has been this, this, this mischaracterization, I believe, of God. Now, if you have never heard this as a mischaracterization before, I don't accept, expect you to, to fully accept it today. I want you to go and explore it for yourself. But notice what some skeptics have said. Christopher Hitchens, a very vocal atheist, said, God loves you so much that he created hell to torture you forever just in case you don't love him back. Is that unsettling to you? Like it's unsettling to me? Like God loves you so much he gave his son so that you could burn forever and ever if you reject his son and be tortured unendingly throughout ceaseless ages. Robert G. Ingersoll, the great, known as the great agnostic, said against the heartlessness of the Christian religion, every grand and tender soul should enter into solemn protest. The God of hell should be held in loathing, contempt, and scorn. I want no part in any heaven. So he's like, I, look, I don't want to be in heaven if it's like this, in which the saved, the ransomed, and redeemed will drown with shouts of joy and praise to God the cries and sobs of hell. Can you imagine unending, unceasing ages as you are singing with a choir in heaven and, and knowing that your uncle, I'm thinking of some name that I don't know of anybody, right? Uncle Frederick, you know that he rejected Jesus and you know that currently he is writhing in pain and you're meanwhile singing glory to the lamb, holy, holy, holy forever and ever. Richard Dawkins says it this way. He's a, another, uh, an author who wrote The God Delusion, Delusion. Who will say with confidence that sexual abuse is more permanently damaging to children than threatening them with the eternal and unquenchable fires of hell? Something for you to consider. Could this actually be seen as child abuse to a child? Then the comedian. We're going to end on a little lighter note. If you do any of these ten things, talking about the Ten Commandments, God has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live 
and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. He loves you. And he needs your money. (laughs) He always needs money. You see, skeptics and infidels and, and agnostics and atheists have become so hardened against this concept of God. And maybe they should be. Maybe if this is who God, maybe I don't believe in this God either, put it that way. On the other hand, I do want Hitler to receive justice, don't you? I want it to be clear that that Hitler will never have a chance again to go on and create this type, the type of suffering that he created. I want for justice to create peace throughout eternity. Psalm 37 verse 2 gives us this encouragement as we think about people like Hitler, as we think about the evil in the world around us today, as we think about why, why all this pain and suffering that people are causing. It says, do not fret because of evildoers. Well, hang on. How, well, why, why should I not fret about evildoers? I'm, I'm sick of all this. For they will what? They'll wither quickly like the grass. A metaphor saying, just like the grass, when the sun comes, we see this in California all the time. Every year we're like, yay, there's green grass. And then a month later, where'd our green grass go? (laughs) It withers and it goes away. Then it goes on to say, and fade like the green herb. Our summer crops are going out of our garden now. They eventually fade as the sun, uh, as the seasons change. Evildoers will be, what's that word? Cut off. This is a, a picture of an end that will come. They will be what? They will be in some corner of the universe writhing in pain? Not what Psalm 37 says, right? They will be no more. They will not be there. Psalm, verse 20 says, the wicked will perish. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Have you ever lit a fire and then you put the fire out? There may be a whole lot of smoke that goes up, but what happens to that smoke? It eventually dissipates and goes away. And that fire's consequence is eternal and complete. However, the smoke eventually vanishes. Verse 20 says, when the wicked are cut off, what? You will see it. So sometimes uh, traditional understanding of, of, of hell would look at this, these verses and say, well, that's going to happen in your lifetime. Have you seen all the wicked people cut off in your lifetime? Or do they sometimes end in a mansion like everything is good? Sometimes they're not cut off in this lifetime. Sometimes it doesn't seem like justice is served. And the Bible goes on and on through, throughout the Old Testament um, Sometimes those who espouse a traditional understanding of hell will skip over the Old Testament because they say it doesn't talk about hell. However, it does talk about the destruction of the wicked over and over. Psalm chapter 1 verse 4 says they will be like chaff which is blown away. They will be like a snail that melts, Psalm 58, verse 8. They will be like grass that's cut down, like wax that melts, Psalm 68. They'll be like a clay pot that's broken, Psalm 2, like water that flows away. We see this all the time in the Salinas River, but here's the, the water's flowing for a while, then it gets hot, and we're like, wait, where did our water go? It's gone. It, flew, it, it flowed away. Smoke that vanishes, Psalm 68, verse 2, like stubble before the wind. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, there are 70 metaphors and similes similar to this, giving us the idea that, that the reality is that Hallelujah, evil will be done away with forever. Can you say hallelujah to that? That there will come an end to evil where it will never more come again? So what impression do these metaphors leave you with? Maybe turn to your neighbor for a second and say, what, what impression do these metaphors leave you with? Do they leave you with the idea that uh, there will be a place where people continue to be tormented unendingly throughout eternity? Or do they leave you with the idea that the wicked will vanish and be gone? Maybe it's more of a rhetorical question, <laughs> but you can talk to your neighbor about it. Consistently, we find that these metaphors illustrate that evil will come to a complete and full end. And I'm glad that God is that big, that he's able to do away with evil forever so that it will never come up again. Obadiah 
verse 16 says this. They will, talking about the wicked, become as if they had what? Never existed. There will be a full and complete end. The Bible is super clear about that. And I'm thankful for that because I don't want to worry that, you know, 200 billion years from now, well, hang on. What if Hitler figures out how to break out of that place because I don't want any more concentration camps. I don't want to experience what he did again. I want that to be done away with forever. I want it to come to a complete and full end. When you know the Old Testament background of the destruction of the wicked, the words of Jesus make a lot more sense. For instance, you know this verse well. John 3, 16, for God, say it with me, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You notice this doesn't say, look, there are two qualities of eternal life. You can either have eternal life in such a way that God sustains you to to writhe in torment and agony forever and ever, or you can have eternal life in a place of bliss. That is simply not the, the option in the most commonly understood gospel promise. It's either to perish or to have eternal life. And the Old Testament context makes it clear what that'll look like. It's not that it will literally look like a snail, that melts away, or like grass that withers. These are all metaphors, but, but when I see the wicked come to their end, I will not look at that and say, well, that's nothing like grass withering away, and that's nothing like smoke vanishing, and that's nothing like because they're still there. <laughs> Instead, I will look at that and I'll say, wow, this makes sense why God put it that way. Does that make sense? Jesus said it this way, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. So he says, don't be afraid of those who can come and put an end to your body, but they're not able to put an end to your soul. Do you see how the two go hand in hand? Look, there's there's the killing of the body that we know what that looks like. The killing of the soul looks the same as well. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Put a complete and full end to both of them in hell. There's not a picture of the soul going on while the body is demolished in hell. There's a picture where both come to an end. Now, this is a little heavy, right? <laughs> This afternoon, please go read the rest of Matthew chapter 10, because then he goes on to say, you know the sparrows, um, aren't they sold for two copper coins, and yet not one of them is missing, and your father cares for them? And, And did you count the hairs on your head today, because God is watching out for the hairs on your head, and you're of much more value than many sparrows, therefore do not fear. He actually doesn't want us to be afraid at all. R.F. Weymouth, an one of the first ones to translate the New Testament into a modern language puts it this way. My mind fails to conceive a grosser misrepresentation of language than when the five or six strongest words which the Greek tongue possesses signifying destroy or destruction are explained to mean maintaining an everlasting but wretched existence. When we say destroy, when we say destruction means, well, yeah, that's an everlasting, ongoing, uh, wretched existence. It's the opposite of what these Greek words mean. It means to perish. It means to be destroyed. It's to translate black as white is nothing compared to this. And when you're translating another language and you, you see the color black and you translate it as white, it's the exact opposite. And he says, look, you're doing the exact opposite if you say that this means to live on forever and ever. Another very common verse. For the wages of sin is eternal conscious torment. Are you sure? You can look it up. I'm using the New American Standard Bible today, except for for this verse. Right? For the wages of sin is? It's death. It's not eternal, ongoing, conscious torment. It is death. It is an end. Notice There's a contrast to that. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Life or death, those are the two options that we have. The Bible is clear. We are choosing between death and life. Not between a life of suffering and a life of bliss. You don't get those options. You get the option of either living forever or of ceasing to exist. And I'm thankful that God is able to put a complete end to evil, aren't you? 
I'm thankful that he's that big and that good because when we read through the Bible, things can get pretty bad. You just look not many centuries after Adam and you find that the world is out of control. There's violence. There's all types of corruption that's going on. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, When the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Is there hope for somebody like that? I mean, would you look at them and say, well, hang on. Maybe we should only give them 10 years in prison because maybe eventually they'll change their mind. (laughs) The picture here that God is saying is, look, they are incorrigibly evil. They are fully set in their ways. There is absolutely no hope that they're going to change. The, The thoughts of their heart are only evil, and that is continual. And then it says, all flesh had, notice, what's that word? Corrupted their way upon the earth. That's, that's the Hebrew word shakat. It's, it's the word for corruption, which can also be translated as destroyed, where all flesh had basically destroyed their way upon the earth. And then he speaks to Noah and says, all, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with what? Violence. Would you want to live in a place like that? That's like an invitation to go live in the midst of World War II and to to live in the midst of the violence that was going on. It was filled with violence. The earth was filled with violence. And then God's answer to that is he said, I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy, the word is shikat, to corrupt all flesh. So they have corrupted themselves and I'm giving them over to their corruption. We're going to look at that more next week as to what God's judgment and justice in hell looks like. But it's really clear here that he's giving them over to what they've already chosen. That is to corrupt themselves and to uh, totally ruin the earth. And as scholars look at this, and you can see it when you read through it, there's a clear picture here. God created a, a firmament that separated the waters from the waters below. The flood is the undoing of creation and taking it back to the formless void state that it was at the beginning of creation. It's, it's allowing creation to go back to its state before God created it. And then he goes through the steps of recreation. But before that happens, he says, Noah, Noah, you build an ark. And, and my spirit is going to contend with people for 120 years. And for 120 years, Noah preaches that there's a flood coming. And here's what we do. We build this ark, and he invites people onto the ark. The animals come onto the ark, but unfortunately, no humans come onto the ark. Now, I haven't watched it, but that, the Hollywood film on Noah, uh, I hear that it actually has him like trying to keep people off the ark. That's the opposite of the Bible. The Bible picture is, look, if anybody's willing to be saved, come on in. Everybody is welcome. Everybody is welcome. We simply have to heed the invitation. Unfortunately, they didn't until the storm already had begun and the flood was already rising. And what's the picture that the Bible gives us during this flood? Genesis chapter 7 verse 21 says, All flesh that moved on the earth, what does that say? They perished. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, what does that say? Died. Thus he blotted every, out every living thing. Is there room here to say, well, maybe some of these, maybe this is like metaphorical? Notice what Edward Fudge says, and we're going to talk about him a little bit later on. But Edward Fudge says this, we don't read that, the flood narrative, and say, well, actually, perish and died don't really mean perish and died. That's not what it actually means here. It means that they, they never did perish and they never will die, but that they wish they could die and that they have a miserable time of it because they just can't die. That's what it actually means here. We don't read the flood narrative and say that, so why do we read John 3.16 that way? Why do we read John 3.16 and say, well, perish means to, to go on in unending suffering. That's not anything anybody ever said about the flood. Matthew 24.37 it says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be, what does that phrase say? Just like the days of Noah. The flood is given to us as an example. Peter says it more clearly in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. He says, there will come mockers who will say, what is the sign of his coming? And then, they'll, and then it goes on to say, the world at that time, being back at the flood time, was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, 
the Lord is not slow. Well, so, so here's a picture. You have water that destroyed the earth, and it says the same exact picture is what's going to happen when there is fire on the earth. So what happened to the people who chose to reject the plan of salvation? Are they still around today? They perished, right? They came to a full and complete end. And the same picture is given for the final destruction. And then it says in in 2 Peter earlier on, it says, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. But the good news here is the Lord is not slow about his promise. Look, if that's what's going to happen to this planet, then why hasn't it happened already? But is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for how many? All to come to repentance. He's, he's not going to bring this to an end until everybody possible has the opportunity to accept his love. Is God good? Amen. He's so incredibly good. And when I look at the world and I see the suffering and the pain, I have to, to ask myself, why? Why all the pain? Why all the suffering? And sometimes we wonder, why does God continue to allow it to keep going on like this? The reality is that it wasn't always this way. You read the beginning of the Bible. He didn't create it this way. But the opposite reality is also true. It won't end this way. There won't be a coming day where there is still crying in the universe. One day, Revelation 21 makes it really clear. He will wipe how many tears? Every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Is that clear? (laughs) No more pain. No more crying throughout the universe for all of eternity. And I can worship a God like that. Can't you? The first things have passed away. Behold, I am making how many things? All things new. God is good. He will bring evil to a complete end. Okay, so you're saying sounds nice, but doesn't the Bible teach about eternal hellfire? Like, okay, I, I like that philosophically, but I will stand on the word of God. And I hope that if you've never heard this before, that's exactly what you're saying. You're like, well, hang on here. Let's, let's, let's do some, some, some research here. Let's go a little bit more in depth into the Bible. And so we're not going to have time to go into all of the verses, but let's just look a little bit more here. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, the sheep and the goats parable. Jesus says, these, the goats, will go away into what? Eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There it is. Did you see it? There will be eternal punishment, And there will be eternal life. Hey, that's super clear, right? This is why when we come to the Bible, here's a basic Bible study principle. We've got to go with all of the Bible and not just take one verse. And when we go with all the Bible, we continue to explore and say, okay, this this is absolutely the word of God. It's absolutely true. And what does it mean? Maybe I've misunderstood this because of church tradition that brought me to the place that I'm at. So let's look at eternal in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9 says that we have this high priest who has brought us eternal salvation. Here's a question. Two billion years from now, as you are in heaven, will you be in the process of being saved? No? But the Bible says it is eternal salvation. So that means it must be going on for eternity, right? Or is salvation a done deal in Jesus Christ? And when you're on the sea of glass, you're not going to be worried anymore about whether Jesus will save you because you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. It's eternal salvation. Similarly, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says that there is eternal redemption in Christ Jesus. Throughout eternal ages, we won't continue to be being redeemed Because we have been redeemed. It's a done deal in Jesus. Amen? How about judgment? Hebrews chapter 6 verse 2 says that there is eternal judgment. So does that mean that throughout eternity I'm going to continue to have to go before Jesus and continue to experience the the judgment day by day? Is this this the, the reality of eternity? Or is the judgment eternal in consequence and nature? 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 says eternal destruction. It's a little bit more similar to what we were looking at. And then we have eternal punishment. 
Can you see here how each of these things, it doesn't mean that there's eternal saving. It's eternal salvation. It's a done deal. In the same way, it doesn't mean there's eternal punishing, like it's going to continue on where God has to continue to punish somebody unendingly throughout eternity. No, eternal punishment can be a done deal, and God can complete this process of getting rid of evil forever. If you wonder about this, think about the cross. This is where eternal salvation was accomplished. And what did Jesus go through on the cross? Did he fully experience what the wicked will go through? Did he experience the consequences of sin? That's the only way we could have a savior, right? Is that, that, that he was willing to lay down his life for you and me in order that we could experience forgiveness. And so that gives me this, this amazing revelation that I can look to the cross and I can understand what hell looks like. And I want to, I'm afraid of hell, right? I want to stay away from hell because I don't want to go through the God forsakenness that Jesus went through on the cross, As he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweat drops of blood. And he he said, Father, take this cup from me. I don't want to go through that. And I can say that at the same time that I say, you know what? I'm not afraid of being tormented by God forever and ever and ever. Because is Jesus still hanging on the cross today? Is he still going through that experience of bearing our sin for us? No, it came to an end. Did Jesus fully experience the consequences of our sin? He sure did. He said, it is finished. But Jesus is not still suffering on the cross. Jude chapter 7, we'll look at this one also, says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember those cities, are exhibited as an example. An exhibit is something you go you know, to an exhibit at an exhibit hall and you see here's exhibit A, here's exhibit B. As an example, here's an example of something. This shows you, I want to understand what this looks like. Well, look at, what are we looking at? Sodom and Gomorrah are the exhibition, the example, in undergoing what? The punishment of eternal fire. Hang on. Has anybody traveled to the Middle East? Have any of you gone to where Sodom and Gomorrah were? Are there fires still burning there? Absolutely not. We find amazing things there. Like we think, well, maybe this came from the fires, but there is not a fire that continues to burn. And you find this repeatedly in the Old Testament where it says, look, God's bringing judgment on this nation and it will be a consuming fire. It will be an eternal fire. It will be an unquenchable fire. Absolutely, it will accomplish an eternal destruction. It will never again be built. It will never again be there. That is eternal fire. It's complete in nature. Sodom and Gomorrah isn't still burning today. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah for a minute. You remember as the angel visitors come into town and they go to stay at Lot's house and Lot begs for them to stay there saying it's too dangerous for you to stay in the square out there. And then the men come pounding on the door of his house begging that they could know these two visitors. Um, And instead he, he gives this horrible offer saying take my daughters instead. And then thankfully the angels step in and they, uh, they, they, the men are blinded. Well, then these two men come to, to Lot and they're like, hey, Lot, this place is hopeless. It's incorrigibly evil. The thoughts of their hearts are continually evil. It doesn't say all that exactly, but that's the, the picture that we get here. There's no hope for, for <coughs> Sodom. Abraham has been pleading with God, if there's even just 10, he got all the way down to 10, please, would you save Sodom. And God said, sure, I'll do it for 10. So the angels are saying, Lot, we got to, you got to get out of here because there's, there's no hope here. But what does it say? Genesis 19, verse 16, but Lot, what? He hesitated. He's like, whoa, whoa, hang on. Maybe I want to stay here. Maybe, uh, and he didn't go out immediately. We have to be very careful as we warn people that evil is coming to a complete end and you want to separate yourself from evil and and connect yourself to the life and relationship that there is in Jesus that we realize the compassion that God has. Because even for Lot who hesitated and wanted to stay in Sodom and Gomorrah, the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters and drugged them out of the city. (laughs) God's like, no, 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 not today. I'm saving you. And he pulled them out of the city 
to salvation. God will save everyone possible. He's not willing that anyone should perish. Hallelujah. There's good news in Jesus. It says, why? For the compassion of the Lord was upon him. Even in the midst of a time of judgment, we see that God's compassion is moving for anybody who will at least not fully resist him and he can even drag them out and save them. And they brought him out. But here's the reality that Christianity, now this is an extreme version of it, but we have to be careful that we don't do this to one extent or another. This is the Westboro Baptist Church. You can go to their website easily by just going to godhatesfags.com. That's their church website. I think maybe we should get the website godislove.com and maybe see if we could get that to route to Templeton Hills. Wouldn't that be cool? I think that'd be super cool. I'm sure it's already taken. Um, Same-sex marriage, dooms nations, death penalty for fags, soldiers die for fag marriage, mourn for your sins, you're going to hell. These are the types of, of signs that we see all the time. You're driving down the freeway and you see the sign, Jesus or hell, we've got them around here. And, and what is that spark in the mind of somebody that has the picture of hell that we have often shared with the world as Christians? They're like, man, these guys are nuts. This is horrible. I got to save my kids from this madness. This indoctrination is crazy. But notice what Jesus had to say about the, the final destruction. Woe to you, Chorazin, and woe to you, Bethsaida. He goes on to say, These are, you're the cities that, that I have done a lot of my miracles in. I've done tons of miracles for you. It will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon. Now... Does the king of Tyre ring a bell for you at all? You need to read Ezekiel chapter 28 this afternoon. Because in Ezekiel chapter 28, you find that, that, well, we'll get to that in a second. In the day of, it'll be more tolerable in the day of judgment for you, in, in the day of judgment than for you, for Tyre and Sidon. In Ezekiel 28, the king of Tyre is compared to Lucifer, the covering cherub who corrupts himself and fire comes from within and destroys him. That's what the king of Tyre is compared to. He's compared to Lucifer or Satan. There's like this, he's talking to the king of Tyre, but we understand that, hey, this is just talking about Satan. So there's this close tie between the king of Tyre and Satan. You might even say he must be a ancient Satanist, right? What did Jesus say? It will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than it will be for you, Chorazin and Bethsaida, because if they had seen the miracles you've seen, they would have repented if they had just seen what you have seen. And you, Capernaum, do you know where Capernaum was? That was Peter's hometown. That's, if Jesus had anywhere that he stayed during his lifetime, he'd stay at Peter's house. This was his hometown where he, he spent the majority of his time teaching, the majority of his miracles. We, we find that, that of any place, Capernaum was the place that saw the most of Jesus and had the most access to Jesus. So then you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. Another word for hell. It will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom. Did you just read what I read? It will be more tolerable for who? The land of Sodom. That was, Jude tells us, destroyed because of their sexual uh, sin. It will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. The reality in the Bible is that those with the greatest access to Jesus have the greatest responsibility. Welcome to church. I didn't mean to place a heavy burden on you. But here's the reality. I've got to look within first because I have the greatest responsibility. That doesn't make any sin or any evil okay. It simply means that I have light. I have the Bible. I read the Bible every year. And so that means I need to hold myself to the highest level of accountability. Could it be that Christians misrepresenting Jesus is a bigger issue to God? Okay, I hope that you don't stone me after this. Then Satanists, king of Tyre, and the LGBTQ plus community, Sodom. They got really quiet in here. Does that sound like heresy this morning? 
You're like, hang on, hang on. Those are the worst possible things in the world today. How could he possibly say that Christians misrepresenting God could be worse than that? How in the world could he say that? Well, let's try a little illustration. When things get intense, I like to put pictures of my kids up because I see your smiles again. All right, so here's the pictures of my kids. Um, I want you to imagine for a second that Leah and I hire a babysitter. We've never met this person before, but we've done background checks and we trust them. So Abby, Livy, and Nathan, we, we leave for an evening and we leave them with a babysitter. Now, Abby and Livy and Nathan are normally perfect, but this night they decided not to be perfect. And they make some mistakes and, and some things that are really horrible and, and some things that I'm, I, I as a parent would be super embarrassed of. In fact, they're, they're really nasty and mean and hateful and hurtful and, and it's horrible what they do that night. Now, don't worry, girls, this isn't for real. But I want you to imagine for a second that that babysitter says, all right, girls, all right, Nathan, here's the deal. When mom and dad come back, if you don't straighten up, here's what's going to happen to you. When mom and dad come back, they are going to rip your fingernails off. They're going to shut you up in the closet. They're going to uh, pour water over your head continuously until you can barely breathe. They're going to put you on a rack and stretch you. They're going to, they're going to torture you unendingly until you stop being such a bad little, little kid. And so we come home, and I wanted to ask you a question. Which would be more egregious to Leah and I? The actions of my children, which were horrible, the worst things that I could imagine children doing. It was horrible. Or the actions of that babysitter in misrepresenting me to my children. The actions of, my, of the babysitter would absolutely be by far worse because I want my kids to trust me. I want them to love me. And how are they ever going to trust and love me if they think that I would torture them unendingly throughout eternity if they won't obey me? And yet this is the picture that we as Christians, well-meaning, please don't take this as a personal affront, well-meaning that we have presented to the world. In the book, The Great Controversy, um, Ellen White puts it this way. It is beyond the power of the human mind to estimate the evil. Is that a lot of evil? I, I've seen a lot of evil. I can estimate a lot of evil. It's beyond the power of the human mind to estimate the evil, which has been wrought by the, there's another strong word, the heresy of eternal torment. Because look, eternal torment that heresy has created more evil in the world than you can even fathom in your brain. The religion of the Bible, this is what the Bible is all about. We just went through a series on the character of God. The religion of the Bible, full of love and goodness and abounding in compassion, is darkened by superstition and clothed with terror. When we consider in what false colors Satan has painted the character of God, can we wonder that our merciful creator is feared, dreaded, and even hated? No wonder that people are living crazy lives out there. No wonder that they're so godless. No wonder there's a rise in atheism and nuns. No wonder we as Christians have misrepresented the loving character of God. Have mercy. The appalling views of God which have spread over the world from the teachings of the pulpit. Hold up. You mean that church can be one of the biggest problems? Don't just take my word for it, please. Go to the word of God. The abhorrent, the appalling views of God which have spread over the world from the teachings of the pulpit have made thousands, yes, millions of skeptics and infidels. Have mercy. You see, the biggest problem in the world today is really our misrepresentation of God because we have the greatest light as we come in contact with Jesus. But I'm thankful that that is changing in Christianity. You know that, that uh, Ellen White was writing like 100 years, 100 plus years ago, like she died in 1915. So this was, this was way ahead of her time as far as scholarship and Christianity. It was, it was seen as heresy. She was seen as the heretic to say outlandish things like that, to say that God is that good. You're making God too nice. You're making God too good. She was an advocate for the goodness of God. But recently, uh, over the last maybe 80 years, 
We've seen a, a rise in some of the most preeminent scholarships in theology today, like F.F. F. Bruce, Clark H. Pinnock, N.T. Wright, Richard Bauckham, John Stott, who are all beginning to say, no, 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 hang on. The Bible does not paint that picture of God. Don't take it as, as my word. Don't take it as the Seventh-day Adventist church's word. Go and read the scholars out there on the cutting edge of theology today because they are saying, no, here's the reality. That's not who God is. The Bible does not reveal that picture of God. I want to encourage you, if you are a reader and you like scholarly theology, read The Fire That Consumes. This is known as the textbook on this topic by Edward William Fudge. And, and it just goes in depth throughout the Bible, throughout history, throughout every, turning over every stone to say, okay, what's the reality of this? If you're not a big reader, but you like to read more uh, armchair reading, then read Hell, A Final Word by Edward Fudge. And if you don't like to read at all, then I want to encourage you uh, to watch the lecture by Edward Fudge. It's only an hour long. You can take an hour on YouTube, right? From the Lanier Theology Library, The Fire That Consumes, a Biblical and Historical Study of the Doctrine of Final Punishment. Edward Fudge is known in the scholarly world as the expert on what I'm propounding today that Scripture teaches, and that is the final end, the complete end of the wicked. And if you don't even like to watch scholarly lectures, then simply re watch the movie. Can you watch a movie? <laughs> I don't normally recommend movies, but this is a good one to recommend. I've showed it at a church before. Hell and Mr. Fudge. It's the story of Edward Fudge and his journey to finding these truths that are revealed in the Bible. The reality is that there is evil and suffering in the world, and this is one of the greatest barriers to people believing that God is love. But it wasn't always this way. And it won't end this way. The Bible is clear. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Hallelujah. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, mourning or crying or pain in the entire universe. The first things have passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. The Bible promises a complete end to evil. One day the universe will be at peace from one end to the other. There will be no more death, there will be no more crying, and there will be absolutely no more pain. There will be a complete end to evil. I, we can applaud Jesus, we can applaud the word of God. Truly, God is so good. Amen. God is incredibly, incredibly good. You can have a reliance on this reality that God is good. And we're going to look at that a little bit more in depth next week to say, okay, but there is an end to the wicked. How could God's goodness be seen in even that? But I want to invite you. Do you want to live in this reality of peace forever and ever? I know I do. I want to experience his love and peace throughout eternity. If that's your desire, I want to invite you to stand as we sing the song that we're familiar with, The Goodness of God. Oh God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that your goodness is running after us. And God, if there's anybody in this place that's been resisting that goodness, oh Lord, would we stop running and turn around and realize we don't have to chase after you. You've been chasing after us. May we open our hearts and minds to you today. And Father, maybe some of us are like, what in the world did, he, did Pastor Zach just share today? This is crazy. Then Father, drive us to the word of God to explore these things, to say, is this the truth that's taught to us in Jesus? And Father, for those of us that have heard about this all of our lives, we've, we've grown up understanding that this is the reality of the Bible. Help us to know that we've got good news to share with the world, that there are people out there who don't believe in you because of the lies that have been shared about you, how you've been misrepresented. Help us to share the goodness of your character with the world out there. Thank you that we have this opportunity and this gift. Thank you that you are good and that there is no shadow of turning with you. You're good from beginning to end. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.